All right. Um, well, then, good morning. Um, we're two minutes after the hour, and so we will get started. I see that we have a lot of folks joining us. So welcome to our March Neary GSC general meeting. Um, it is so exciting to be here with all of you, um, and soon we will introduce our speaker for today. Um, so just uh, the agenda, we'll be beginning with um, some announcements about our some new members and some upcoming Neary GSC initiatives. We will then introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Marshall Shepard from the University of Georgia, um, where he will give a presentation and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, if there is time after that, we will have breakout rooms by um, research field, and then we'll wrap up just before, this is an Eastern time, but just before noon central time. So first, I'd like to welcome all, all of our new and returning vice elects. Uh, we had elections very recently for all of the vice officer and working group uh, positions. And so I'd really like to uh, welcome all of our new and returning folks. Um, really excited to work with all of you as well as with the, with the rest of the board. And so if you see someone uh, that you recognize in the group, please feel free to send them a congratulations message. It's a really, it's a really big, um, and sometimes thankless job, but we're all really excited to get to work. I'd, um, okay, for some reason, the new member slide has disappeared, but I'd also really like to welcome our new members um, to, to Neary GSC. We have about a dozen new members this month um, who have joined us. So um, thank you all so much for joining us. This is a really fun and exciting um, and, and really intellectual research organization. We have exceptional speakers, a ton of upcoming interesting events. And so if you have any questions about anything regarding Neary GSC, please don't hesitate to reach out to Faith or Sasan, our chair and vice chair of membership, as well as anyone on the board. We're more than happy to answer questions and get you in the loop. Um, additionally, I'd like to make a plug for the Neary GSC mini conference. Um, I'd really like to thank um, my co-organizers, Jasmine, Rakesh, and Olani. Um, we've been working really hard, and so we're really excited to announce that the inaugural Neary GSC mini conference will be on Friday, May 26th, 2023. We received an exciting slate of poster and panel presentation submissions, and so we'll be reviewing those soon and announcing the full program. But in the meantime, registration is open. And so please use the QR code if you'd like to register or even just learn more about the mini conference. Additionally, I'd also like to mention that we are looking for abstract reviewers for the panel and poster abstracts that were submitted for the mini conference. This is a great opportunity to sort of dip your feet in. If you've uh, not had the chance to review um, conference or journal abstracts, but are interested in staying in academia and doing that work, so if you would like to get involved in that, please feel free to contact myself, Rakesh, Jasmine, or Olani, um, or use the QR code. There is a spot in the registration um, to uh, state your interest to review. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. Marshall Shepard. Dr. Shepard is a leading international expert in weather and climate and is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Sciences and Geography at the University of Georgia. His research focuses primarily on hydrometeorological extremes, urban climate, and the intersections of atmospheric sciences with society. He uses remote sensing, weather climate modeling, and risk vulnerability approaches to address challenges such as urban flooding, the energy food water nexus, weather climate risk, and communication warnings. In addition to his research, he also serves as the director of the UGA Atmospheric Sciences Program, the Associate Director of Climate Science and Outreach, the Institute for Resilient uh, Infrastructure Systems, and as a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He also previously served as the president of the American Meteorological Society. And if all of that wasn't impressive enough, and I geeked out at this, he is also a host at the Weather Channel Weather Geeks and a weather and climate contributor at Forbes. He joins us today to discuss science communication, a vitally important topic for young and seasoned scholars alike, as we are called on to discuss our knowledge and research findings to a variety of audiences. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Shepard. I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? 
Okay, great. So thank you all for the invitation. Uh, I, I don't know much about your organization. But I know a little bit about it. I, I know at least, uh, Robin, I think you were at UTSA. Is that correct? Or uh, did I see that on your email? That is one correct. Of, yeah, one of my former PhD students is a faculty member at University of Texas San Antonio, Dr. Neil Debich. So I know you're familiar with him, uh, perhaps. Yes. Um, He's awesome. But, uh, Yes, he is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I I wanted to kind of just start this by saying I'm an anti-academic. What does that mean? <laughs> I am the anti-academic. Uh, I was not sort of raised in a marinade of going and getting a PhD and going right to a postdoc or going right into a faculty position. Uh, I spent the first 12 years of my career at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center as a scientist. Uh, and so because of that, when I decided to come to the University of Georgia in 2007, 2006, rather, um, I had the lens of being a scientist for 12 years outside of an academic ivory tower institution. Uh, and I've brought some of that into the ivory tower because I firmly believe that this generation of students, you all, need to be end-to-end -end scholars. And what I mean by that is, Universities do an amazing job of teaching you how to do research and write proposals and write papers and go to conferences and get on the academic treadmill and do that all over again. But it does a terrible job at teaching you how to be end to end scholars, how to interact with Congress, uh, interact with the media and so forth. And so I think we completely need a new paradigm within the ivory tower. And that's because even as some of you will go off and become scholars and get jobs and tenure track positions or perhaps a, a junior uh, researcher job in a government lab, you aren't incentivized to do anything but write papers and write grants and do the things that are sort of the old school academic metrics of success. Well, I'm going to throw a sort of a, a sort of a, a harmless bomb right into that narrative because I actually am the scholar in my department that leads the department in peer-reviewed publications every year in, in extramural grants, but I also host a show for the Weather Channel, a podcast, and I write for Forbes, and I testify for before Congress, and I tweet. I'm at Dr. Shepard 2013 if you're on Twitter, so be, be sure to give me a follow. And I am very much sort of a verse that almost makes me throw up when I hear someone in academia say, well, how do you find time to do all that extra stuff? How do you find time to do those new things like Twitter? Newsflash, Twitter's not new. It's been around a while, and it's very much a part of the lexicon of science now. So I just wanted to give those introductory remarks before I jump into my, now, uh, my discussion here. So I'm going to share my screen, and we'll go from there. I even have some cupcakes for you. <laughs> so tips for communication science for to people who are not scientists. Um, I, I really wanted to start here because, you know, commu I say communication science, but what I really mean there is how do we take this notion of science and talk about it to people who aren't scientists? I, I think that's an important point. And you, you see there in the quote that I gave in some magazine, I said, I believe too many scientists are comfortable in the ivory tower, journal space and conferences. However, a gale of misinformation rushes in to replace the void if we are not at the table communicating. Look, I have a pretty high citation rate. I've, I looked at it the other day on Google Scholar. It's decent. But even my highest cited paper is about 800 citations. That's pretty good. But I've had 20 million people read my Forbes article. So I'm reaching far more people in science in those formats. And so uh, you can see I, I hosted the Weather Geeks TV show for the Weather Channel. And you can see that up there on the top right. It's now a podcast because people have just changed the way they consume science information. There are all of my coordinates, all of the things that I do. Uh, and again, I want to say this, and I want to reiterate this from my introduction. In 2021, I was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Those are pinnacle scientific achievements. And the only reason I say that, I'm not bragging, the only reason I say that is because I want you to understand that you can achieve the highest levels of success as a scholar and still do these quote unquote extra things. And so let's kind of dive into this. This is one of the best pieces of science communication I've ever seen. 
It's by my colleague, Brad Panovich, who's a TV meteorologist in Charlotte, North Carolina, because we know that people struggle with distinguishing between a tornado watch and tornado warning. I get it all the time. Uh, I've heard people say, well, a tornado watch means you're watching the tornado and a warning means it might happen. Well, in fact, it's actually the other way around. If there is a tornado warning, that means conditions are likely happening for a tornado or one has been detected on radar. Tornado watch, on the other hand, means that the ingredients are there. So I think this cupcake uh, analogy or meme drives home that point. Cupcake watch, you've got the ingredients for cupcake, cupcake warning, we have cupcake. And so hopefully from that point on, uh, you'll always remember the difference between a hurricane watch and a hurricane warning or a tornado watch and a tornado warning. Just think cupcakes. So hopefully that gives you a sense of how important science communication is. The era of social media has created a significant challenge for us. And I think this little meme really uh, tells the story. You've got this colleague, this scientist, this scholar that has written all of his knowledge and expertise here. And you've got this guy holding a phone saying, no, -uh, some guy on Twitter says you're doing it all wrong. And that's the reality that we face now when we communicate science in the spaces. Uh, everybody has a degree from Wikipedia, Block State University, or Twitter Institute of Technology. And this is what we're facing. And so how do we sort of beat back this sort of perceived keyboard knowledge and expertise uh, in a realm where you're bringing true scholarship and expertise to the table? I remember back during Hurricane Irma, which was a significant hurricane in 2017, uh, BuzzFeed actually had to assign a journalist to beat back all of the misinformation that was being propagated and, sh and shared about the hurricane as it was making landfall that so that's just the era that we're in now how many I, i'm hoping that some of you have heard at least of at least some of these but the dunning kruger effect cognitive dissonance confirmation bias and the internet and social media these are the big challenges that we face in an era of science communication we saw quite a bit of it during the COVID and vaccine era, uh, during the pandemic. I, I live and breathe it all of the time as a climate scientist, as a meteorologist. Well, let's talk about what some of these are. The Dunning-Kruger effect is actually a scholarly uh, concept published by a couple of Cornell University psychology professors. And when you read the definition of the Dunning-Kruger effect, it suffers from very typical academic jargon. Let's read it. The Dunning-Kruger effect is defined as a cognitive bias in which unskilled individuals suffer from illusory superiority, mistakenly rating their ability much higher than is accurate. That's, that's academic sort of jargon. In other words, people think they know more than they do about topics and underestimate what they don't know about them. And you see this all of the time in social media or with your uncle at dinner at Thanksgiving when he's telling you his philosophy on climate change, even though I have three degrees in atmospheric sciences. That's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Watch out for cognitive dissonance. I, there's a paper in Nature Climate Change which says that people with increased scientific literacy are actually better at fitting evidence that fits their narratives, ideologies, and cultural perspectives. Give you an example of this. I used to hate going to my doctor because he knew that I was a climate scientist and he would always sort of tell me his theories on climate change, right? He's a medical doctor, very sort of intelligent, scholarly person but you don't know my field better than I do in the same way that I didn't walk into the, uh, the doctor's office trying to tell you about my diagnosis. I'm there because of your expertise. But you often see this really interesting thing where people that you might think, oh, wow, they're pretty intelligent. Well, how, do, how do they not understand that climate change is happening or is real? Uh, because they're able to, because of their sort of perceived level of intelligence of fitting evidence in their own way. So it's not, the challenges aren't simply about lack of science literacy. It's very much about some people being very literate, but and able to sort of, you know, fit narratives to their own ideologies or belief. I'll give you an example here. Here is some data on weather fatalities. And, and this is really kind of meant to illustrate perception. 
Most people, if I had asked you what the deadliest weather event every year in the United States is, a lot of you probably would have said tornadoes or hurricanes or maybe lightning or flooding. When in fact, uh, over the last 30 years, it's heat, right? It's just extreme temperatures. Uh, some of you are in Texas, that extreme cold event from 2021 killed a lot of people, and that wasn't a tornado or a hurricane. Those events are more telegenic, and they generate more buzz on social media, but often extreme heat and then followed by flooding are the most deadly weather fatalities in a given year. And so it just leads to this sort of myriad of perceptions when I'm trying to communicate science. Like, for example, people think heat lightning is a thing. No, it's not. Heat lightning doesn't exist, but you probably have heard someone in your family say it or mention it. Heat lightning is simply lightning that's too far away to hear the, the thunder. And so these are all the perceptions. This is one that in the meteorological community we get a lot. Oh, it must be right, uh, nice to be in a field where you can be wrong 50% of the time and get paid. In fact, Five-day forecasts are about 90% accurate, and as you get beyond five days into the two to three day, even better than that. People just tend to remember the occasional bad forecast. They don't remember the 90% of forecasts that were right. They, they anchor to the one that they remember because it affected their cookout or their kid's soccer game and so forth. So there are all of these perceptions that we deal with and that get sort of further amplified or reinforced in social media. So what I want to do for the remainder of this talk is walk you through these nine tips for communicating science to people who are not scientists. This is based on an article that I wrote in Forbes several years ago, back in 2016 now. This article is almost seven years old. Wow. But the nine tips still haven't changed. They're still as timeless as ever. So let's kind of walk through them. The first one is know your audience. This is one that many people in the ivory tower struggle with. I can't tell you how many times I see scholars take the same presentation that they would give at an AGU meeting or an AAG meeting or an AMS meeting and give that exact same presentation to a Rotary Club or to their church. You have to know your audience because if you do not know your audience, it's like throwing darts at a dartboard with the lights off. The same, you have to be dexterous enough to change your message. Yeah, you know, it, I, I see it all of the time, and then you're just seeing the audience there and you want a more public facing audience, and they're sitting there glazing over at all of this equations and the next thing, jargon, which I'll talk about in a second. So here's a good example. Here are three different sort of messages about sea level rise. And I would use a different version of one of these depending on who my audience was. This is a, the road that connects Savannah, Georgia to Tybee Island where the beach is. This was a king tide flood. There wasn't a storm or a hurricane. There was a king tide flooding and the road flooded. Residents of Tybee Island said they hadn't seen anything like it. Now, this would resonate to them far more than either of these things. This graph here shows satellite data of sea level rise in terms of millimeters per year. This is something I might show at an AGU or an AMS meeting. Over here, I'm showing a SOBI index, a social vulnerability index in parts of the coast that are vulnerable to coastal flooding. This is something that I might show to stakeholders or real estate investors or policymakers. So in other words, these are all sea level rise messaging graphics, but they're not appropriate necessarily for the same audiences. Uh, here's an example of a map. Most people we have learned from studies out of the University of Alabama, Dr. Laura Myers finds that people can't find their county on a map like this. Yet, oftentimes with weather messaging, we'll show maps with counties and say the tornado's headed there. And so this is, again, understanding and knowing your audience. This leads me to something that I alluded to earlier. We're terrible as scholars at using jargon because we've been trained to speak in our jargon, right? We can't do that when we're talking to the public or, or, or policymakers. Our language means something very different to people. So, for example, this is a really nice chart out of a, a paper by Hassel and Somerville published in Physics Today a few, several years ago. 
I mean, these are just terms that mean things to us. Like, you know, in, science, in climate science, we might say that there's a positive trend in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 30 years. That's a true statement. But doesn't the word positive to most average people sound like that's something good? Positive connotes good. But in fact, it's really an upward trend in CO2. And that's a bad thing in terms of climate change. If I say uncertainty, as a scientist, I know that there is an uncertainty around the variable or measurement. Whereas to the public, when they hear the word uncertainty, they think we don't know what we're talking about. And so we have to be aware of and understand uh, this sort of dangers of jargon. So I, I have this aunt and uncle test. I mean, it, it's likely that you have an aunt or an uncle or a relative that's not trained in your, your field. They may be very intelligent, but they're not trained in your scholarship. So always try to use someone as, as a litmus test of whether the things that you're talking about will resonate with them. I use my wife. I mean, she's a very intelligent person, but she's far from being an atmospheric scientist. And so if I start talking about eyewall replacement cycles to her, she doesn't, she's going to look at me like, what are you talking about? Can you just say that the eyewall has died and a new one is formed? Right. So you have to be careful about the jargon that we use uh, when we're talking about our topic. This is a very important one. And you are as graduate status. Oh, I lost my video in a way, it seems. I'm, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll come back here in a second. Let's see if I can get the video back. Okay, I think I switched to the older camera. We'll just stay with it just in the interest of time. Um, This is a very important point, and it's just counterintuitive to how you are trained as graduate students, particularly if you're in STEM. You have to get right to the point when you're talking to uh, the public and policymakers and the media. Now, look at this. This triangle here on the left, that's how you've been trained, likely, as a graduate student to write your thesis or dissertation or give your talk. You write 100 pages of lit review and background material. You tell us the methodology. And then two, 300 pages later in your dissertation, you told us what you found. You go give a talk. You give all the background and all the data. And then an hour later, you tell us what you found. That's how, you were, that's how we're all trained as scholars, right? When we're communicating to the public, you've got to tell them what you found right up front. When you're communicating to a policymaker or testifying before Congress, they want to know the bottom line right up front. So you really almost have to invert this triangle. This is one of the most important lessons I'll leave with you today because it's fundamentally counter to how you have likely been trained as a scholar. And so you just have to be able to operate in both spheres. You know, in, in our ivory tower, we operate with this triangle. When you go and talk to the, 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 the city council, you operate from this triangle, right? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very big on using analogies and metaphors. I mean, I often say weather is your mood, climate is your personality. And I'll usually say that when someone tweets me on a cold day and says, hey, Dr. Shepard, what happened to global warming? I got 30 inches of global warming sitting in my yard. That tells me that person doesn't understand that day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week weather does not define climate change any more than your mood today tells me about your overall personality. So I have over the years found that analogies and metaphors are very important in public and science discourse. Though I'm violating it with my own talk today, um, three points and three M's are very important. I'm giving you nine tips today. But there's research that shows that people remember things in threes. So try to sort of, when you're talking broadly, try to sort of dissect your information into three points, distill them into three points, whether it's three focuses of your research, three things you found, three potential applications. People tend to remember things in threes. And then the three M's keep things miniature, meaningful, and memorable. Miniature, meaningful, and memorable. Again, and that's something very counterintuitive sometimes to how we're taught to sort of dig deep as, as scholars. Remember when you're talking to the public, you are the expert relative to the public. I, when I was a scientist at NASA, I, 
Uh, I'd get asked to go and talk to the USA Today or jump on the CNN or Today Show and talk about tsunamis or wildfires. And I said, wait a minute, I'm a, I'm a meteorologist. I, that's, I'm not trained in those things. And the producer at NASA said, yeah, relative to the people you're talking to, you probably know more than they do about it. And so always remember, uh, you are the expert. And different people have different perceptions of what they perceive as expertise. So in meteorology, people perceive their local TV expert as the, the person. Right. Even though this is an example, me and one of my colleagues, Dr. John Knox, we're two PhDs in atmospheric sciences. They might trust this guy more than they trust us on a storm messaging because they they know him, him or her. They have a sort of some type of relationship. They see them every day. There are people that believe the farmer's almanac can actually predict the weather. It can't. Uh, it actually is something that has been uh, been proven to be about 37 percent accurate. And there are people that with a straight face will ask me what I think of the groundhog's spring forecast. And then in the next breath, tell me they don't believe what scientists say about climate change. That's the ultimate example of cognitive dissonance right there, believing a rodent over climate scientists. Then this is an old graphic, but it still makes the point. Most people get their information about science today from the web or from social media, not newspapers, not television. And this is back as of 2012. So it's probably up here now by 2023 or so. So the point here is if you are one of those academics that say, I don't tweet or I don't do Instagram or TikTok, you're missing the place to reach where people go to consume information on science. Well, maybe you don't want to tweet, blog, write a blog, do some things that are making sure you are inserting or injecting your science into social media, because that's where people consume it. I've got to, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, but these are just some of my do's and don'ts. If you do foray into social media, uh, you, you need to make sure you put a disclaimer on your tweets that it's not representing you, your university or your employer. Um, you do, you do need to use social media for network and branding. This is one of the most important uses for me, uh, just sort of meeting up with other people in the fields that I'm in and so forth. Um, you need to think about whether your post could cost you your job, your fellowship, or create other hardships. So when you tweet or post something, actually take a little extra time to sort of sort of really review what the implications of that post or tweet are. I'm not saying don't tweet something that's provocative, but just think carefully about it before you hit that final goal to the public. Uh, set preferences to control who can tag or monitor you. Take the high road. There are some people that like, for in my case, like they 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 get kudos if they're seen as being on Twitter having a debate with Dr. Shepard about climate science when it's clearly clear that they're not actually even close to being accurate or correct. So you have to be able to filter. Now you very much should engage with people if you can help them or uh, increase knowledge. But someone that you can tell that's just sort of sea lioning you, which is a term that I've written about in Forbes, or just trying to sort of gain cred or props from engagement with you, take the high road and just kind of move on. Say thanks and move on. Um, one of the greatest uses of social media is hashtags. You may not be able to attend the meeting in your in your field, but people like the AMS and AGU, people are there and they're tweeting with hashtags things from the sessions and you can follow along. So those are some things that I say are do's. Some don'ts, as I just mentioned, don't play Twitter tennis. Don't go back and forth with someone that's obviously trying to get some street kick cred on you. Don't use profanity or words that can offend others. So this goes back to reviewing those things that you, before you post, don't post compromising pictures of yourself. And as I said, don't give too much cred to trolls. These are just the list of the, the various Twitter I use for engagement. This is where I gauge on whether climate topics promote programs, engage with media and so forth. I have a personal Facebook page, which is just personal stuff. Then I do have a, a, a private public figure page. Instagram is mostly personal stuff. I actually hate LinkedIn, but it's a necessary evil. It's kind of like my virtual Rolodex, but it does kind of annoy me when people <laughs> are endorsing you or congratulating you on an anniversary or something. It can get a little overwhelming. Uh, and blogs and research gate are certainly things out there that you can use as well. So I'm not going to, you know, this is just a little exercise. If this were a longer engagement, I would actually uh, do this little SWOT analysis with you where I would ask you to take five minutes to jot down per strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats of social media from your perspective, and then we would discuss them. But I would leave that perhaps for you and your organizers to kind of conduct in a future meeting of some type. Uh, there are some uh, other readings that I would give out. 
The eighth thing is the myth of popularizers in academia. Uh, this is me actually sitting before a group of senators. You can see the back of uh, Senator Bernie Sanders' head. There's several other senators out here. Here's Senator Bar Barbara Boxer. We were giving a briefing on extreme weather and climate to the senators here, uh, I think after Superstorm Sandy. Um, I, I show this because there was a time when scientists that talked to the media or did things like this or tweeted were considered popularizers or not serious scholars. Well, I, I tell sort of people today that that's kind of an old school mentality. And if there's someone in Ivory Tower that, that believes that, they just need to get over it. Because the reality is we need to be a new generation of scientists that are engaging in all of these spaces. And then the final thing, the ninth thing that I would leave to you is this little acronym called ELFLAND. Learn, internalize this acronym ELFLAND because it is a very useful strategy for how to communicate broadly with people. So I'm going to give you an example. One of the things that we know that here in the South, farmers tend to be skeptical about climate change, right? And so there was a guy named Steve McNulty with a USDA hub in, at NC State that shared this, this term, and I, I adopted it. I love it. He says, when I go out and talk to stakeholders or people that I know may be skeptical about a topic, I don't come in blazing with all my PhDs and scholarly knowledge and so forth. I come in with Elfland. I establish contact with them. I listen to them. I say, what are you seeing on your farm in terms of drought or rainfall? And then when you listen, you find common ground. You know, I might, you might not ever even mention climate change to the farmer, but you talk about how they're seeing more frequent and intense drought in their, on their farm. So you find common ground. And when you do that, that lessens mistrust. Um, and then you can start to assess needs, nurture, and deliver on solutions in a co-produced or co-production framework. So this is an important thing to understand. Uh, Co-production of knowledge and relating to people is something that really helps you improve communication. I'll give you an example of this. I had a staffer here in the state of Georgia. And give me one second here. I had a staffer in the state of Georgia say, well, why do people in Georgia care about drought in California whenever there's drought? And I showed them this map and I said, well, look at all the things that are grown in California that Georgians consume. 92% of strawberries, 95% of broccoli, 91% uh, of grapes and so forth. So when there's drought in California, that's reduced supply, that drives up price for Georgians. And so I found a value system that connected with that obviously at the time, skeptical staffer to, the, to a particular congressperson here in the state of Georgia. So I'm going to end it there because I always find that the questions and interaction is more useful in terms of engaging. I, I like to give that little uh, brief uh, presentation just to sort of stimulate some thought for the discussion. So I'm happy to open it up for some questions here. And, um, and Tay, if you want to help me kind of identify and sort of help moderate, that's fine because I can't see everyone, but I'm going to stop sharing screen so we can sort of get back to the uh, main, main view. That sounds good. Thank you so much um, for this talk. This was incredibly helpful. I'm really like sitting with the, with the three M's uh, at the moment. Um, uh -huh. Feel free, um, folks, to uh, speak up or raise your hand if you'd like, or if you would rather um, ask your question without verbalizing, feel free to also use the chat. Yeah, I'm exactly. And I'm monitoring the chat. And yeah, thank you for sharing my Twitter. I'm also on TikTok at Dr. Shepard Knows and on Instagram at Marsh for FSU with the number four. So I'm happy to have you join me in all those spaces. I'm, I, I try to keep them all pretty active. Perfect. Um, Paula, why don't we start with a question from you? I see your hand raised. Hey, Paula. Hi, Dr. Shepard. This has been about... I hey, can, you, before, can I interrupt you? If, if, as you introduce yeah. yourself, can you tell me who you are, where you're from, where you're at, and what you're working on? Yes, of course. Um, I'm Paula Buchanan. I'm soon to be Dr. Paula Buchanan. Congratulations. Uh, I'm getting my, thank you. I'm getting my doctor of science in emergency management and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And okay, I've you're right down the road for me. <laughs> yes, I've actually seen you at UGA uh, present on this topic in a course, which was great. I've seen you uh, multiple times whenever you do present. I always do try to make sure I attend. Oh, so nice. About my, yeah, my fifth time at the rodeo. Nice. Um, I, <laughs> 
So I do have a question. So I do SciComm and a lot of his, uh, I, I do a lot of what I call public education and outreach in the SciComm space. But unfortunately, because, you know, I will be working in the ac academic institution, you know, the publishing and the conferences and doing those things like, and pre presenting conferences is important. And one of the things I've had a hard time finding, going back to what you were talking about, I'm looking for different journals and conferences that actually focus on SciComm and how you can take that practice from the field and somehow transform it into something that is relevant in academia in the form of, you know, journals and presentations. Um, I've attended a couple of different conferences and I haven't really been impressed. So I was wondering if you have any recommendations. You know, I don't, but one of the things I am starting to at least see uh, is that some of the larger organizations within my field, at least like AGU and AMS, are starting to have sort of little science com sort of mini symposia or workshops within them. And that's a start. Uh, I think a lot of the efforts have been led by the graduate graduate community like you all. I, I know there's a is a SciComm conference that I spoke at at Emory. I don't know if you were there a few years ago. Uh, that was led by a group of graduate students. And one of the things that I have found is that I, yeah, uh, Voices for Science, I think that's one. Uh, AGU Landing is another and so forth. Uh, there's a, if you follow my Twitter, AGU's podcast just tweeted me today because I'm I'm a guest on their podcast. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that there, I, I think there might be, uh, to kind of get at what you're alluding to, Paula, I think there might be space to stand up somewhere along the way, a professional science communication organization. I think another one that has done a good job is AAAS. Uh, in fact, that pyramid diagram that I showed came from AAAS. They had a what, what we know campaign and they have a very vigorous science communication effort going on within AAAS. So I would, I would invite you to explore some of what they're up to as well. Thank you, that's helpful. Yes, and someone asked, uh, Weather Geeks is on all the major platforms for, for podcasts. Spot, someone asked if it was on Spotify. It's, it's pretty much everywhere you get your, plat your, your podcast. Other questions, and don't be shy, please. I'm happy to. And you don't have to ask me just questions about SciComm if you're curious about other things, too. I've done a few things in my career. <laughs> So I have a question. Um, my background is in instructional technology and uh -huh. working with NERI in the educational program. One of the things that my focus is, is encouraging researchers to share on social media and really trying to bring, um, help them understand how it really can impact broader impacts for their research open doors, open doors for funding, uh, help them network, make connections, whether that be for REU students, the graduate students, or those who are well-seasoned and have been researchers for many years. Do you have any specific, um, your, your presentation was awesome, but anything that you found really works, especially for researchers who are already established, and why should they care about Twitter or LinkedIn or presenting on social media that has you know, won them over, if you will. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'm going to share something here, share my screen again. To, and this really is answering your question. Y'all see that? This is something I did a couple of weeks ago. That's Vice President Kamala Harris. Oh, and I and another colleague from Georgia Tech moderated an entire 40-minute entire session with Kamala Harris on climate change. You know how that came about? because one of her staffers follows me on Twitter and then really enjoys my engagement. And so um, being not only on these platforms, but active and engaging, that's that's very important in terms of getting the use out of it because you don't, you'd be surprised at who is following you, your staffers for Congress people that, that testifying before Congress that I did in 2019, uh, right before the world shut down because of COVID. Again, I testified before the House Science Committee because Congresswoman Edie Bernice uh, Johnson's staffer was one of my Twitter followers. He said, you just present information on Twitter in such a clear manner. 
that we wanted you to testify. So uh, engagement leads to opportunities. Engagement in social media has led to grant opportunities and partnerships and so forth. Um, you know, and particularly in an era where some people maybe aren't traveling as much, um, you're not able to go to conferences and engage in the hallways. Uh, it's a way to broaden your network. So, you know what? I mean, some of you have some, some people always say, well, I just don't have the same personality you have, or I just feel, I'm not sure what to say. And those types of things, and those are real concerns, but, you know, it's just a matter of finding a comfort zone, finding the right platform for you, and just being in there. But I completely, and this is controversial, perhaps, but I completely frown on um, anyone that says they just don't do social media, because by saying that, you're just completely ignoring one of the key ways, as I showed you, that people engage on science topics today. Okay, I see a question there in the chat. Uh, do you have recommendations for overcoming imposter syndrome when posting on social media? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, the imposter syndrome is something that really nags a lot of young scholars. And I think we've all faced it. Um, I think it's just a matter of, you know, you know, I'll give you a, a a reverse example of imposter syndrome. I'm an African American scientist, so when I used to walk into rooms at NASA or AMS or whether whatnot, I mean, I always had this sort of feeling that there were people that felt like I didn't either belong in the room or was in the room because I had had some extra help. I'll give an exa another example. Uh, a, a person emailed me uh, saying that they disagreed with something about that I'd written in Forbes about climate change. Now they were obviously skeptics. And then I replied back to them, and then they replied back with an email thread that had this chain of scientists, well-known scientists in my field. And I could see, as I, I don't think he knew that the entire thread had been shared in his reply. And further down that thread, I could see that one person said, oh, yeah, he's just the African-American scientist that's trying to get famous by using climate change. So he sort of used this sort of, he anchored to something to sort of and some throw shade at me, I guess. Um, and so... That was always the imposter syndrome that I, it's sort of a reverse imposter syndrome because I was sort of said, sort of, okay, well, you know, I know my stuff and I'm walking in the room and I belong in the room. And over time, my career and my publications and my scholarship have shown that, but I kind of always had this chip on my shoulder. Let me dust it off. I kind of had this chip on my shoulder um, because I know that that perception was out there, probably still out there in some regards. And some of you candidly are going to face that same perception. So I would say, you know, just develop, you know, you know, be Iron Iron Man or Iron Woman, develop a, a shell because you 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 might feel you might have your own self doubts, doubts about being in there. But the reality is there may be others that doubt that you should be in the room and you just have to accept that kind of say it is what it is and move forward. We also Hello. have Amber. I see a question from Amber up there. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, hi, my name is Amber, and I am a PhD student at Jackson State University. And I want to thank Jackson you. Jackson State, nice. The only undergraduate meteorology program at an HBCU in the country, by the way. Amazing. Okay, I'm in civil engineering. Civil engineering. So I actually didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, they have a good they have a good meteorology program, and the only one at an HBCU. I've spoken there. But okay. continue. Yeah, come back, please. Um, I we deal with uh climate change in uh geotechnical engineering, mm -hmm. particularly as it relates to uh shallow slope failures and expansive um soil like Yazoo clay. And um this that's not related to my question. My question is uh when you presented that slide about how you're supposed to flip the presentation from giving like the bottom line first um that was actually just told to me yesterday when i was um talking with my panelists for a session i'm moderating at geo congress and i wanted to make sure like geo congress is a convening of you know engineers civil engineers american society of civil engineers so should i still use that that flip for the public even though they are all in my field yeah, that's a great question. I, I think you just have to read the room a little bit, but that that really is more sort of your your field, as you note. So you probably yes. those type of people are going to be expecting more of what 
we all do as scholars. And by the way, uh, I have a, a small appointment in engineering here at the University of Georgia uh, because I'm involved with something called our Institute for Resilient Infrastructure Systems, because as you noted, infrastructure is very much uh, vulnerable to climate, climate stresses and forcing. So I would say that in that setting, um, your your audience and again it's remember the first slide and first point in my nine know your audience yes and so your audience for that particular conference is likely going to be more comfortable with a more traditional style of presentation okay. but okay. if you want to provoke and be memorable you can certainly flip it <laughs> but i mean i would say that that audience is probably more in uh, more custom to the it's more standard triangle Thank you so much. Okay, I see Paula uh, had a question, but I, I know I've already responded to something that Paula asked, but I want to make sure before I respond to that, if there's, I mean, we'll keep going because uh, I, I still have plenty of time. Um, I finally, oh, maybe you're just making a comment. Okay, looks like you're just making a comment. So, so yep, fire away. I, I'm yours for about 13 more minutes. <laughs> um, I have, I have a question. Um, okay. So, Who is this uh, speaking? I hear you, but I don't see you. Uh, this okay, is hey. I am, um, uh, so I'm a sociologist and demographer um, at UPenn. And so I was I was um, thinking about, um, or my question is, so um, this is this is really important public engagement. And as you said, this is something that is often really driven by um, graduate students. And so it has been incredibly frustrating um, in uh, what I consider to be a very, you know, traditional academic department to try to foreground the importance of um, communication with the public. We talk about it a lot in terms of public sociology, um, but also for those of us who are more in the social sciences as, as science communication. So I was wondering if you had advice um, as a senior scholar to sort of how to increase the visibility um, within these more traditional departments that maybe disincentivize or just don't take seriously this level of public engagement, despite how often um, it's really it's really called for and pertinent. Yeah, my, the only advice I give is go forth and prosper among this group because we've got to change the 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 demographic. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I mean, I'm relatively on the younger end of the spectrum, and I'm much older than probably a lot of you all, but I'm not that old. But we've got a lot of old school inertia in departments. Just honestly, by the way, my daughter is a first year student at University of Georgia, so sociology major or has declared sociology. Um, but we have to, and it's it's different. I, mean, I, I don't want to sugarcoat this for you all because I'm a senior scholar with tenure. I pretty much say and do what I want. You all have a different sort of march that you have to drum that you have to beat to as uh, junior scholars as you move into your own careers. Having said that, once you get that job in the department, you are a member of that department and your voice should be heard. And so uh, you should sort of really promote the value of, you know, science communication and broader engagement and make the point that that's, you know, that this is not extra stuff. This is a part of just what we need to do, especially in the backdrop of what we're dealing with in society and politically right now, where people are questioning higher education, people are questioning uh, the validity of science. And that's because we're not there as a voice to say, yeah, this is why you should get a vaccine, right? Or this is why, um, you know, that particular, um, you know, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, conspiracy theory is taking hold because you don't have any experts out there pushing back on it. And so, 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 so I, I think go sociology. I think, I think that um, you just have to, you know, we've got to change the the inertia and we've got to insert a different narrative into these environments. I think. By the way, I'm dropping some a little bit more on the imposter syndrome. I'm, I just dropped into the chat my book that I I was so distraught after George Floyd that I woke up one Sunday morning and wrote a book. Literally that Sunday morning, um, it's just a little 65, 70 page handbook about. It's called the Race Awakening of 2020: uh, six, six Step Guide to Moving Forward. And the reason I wrote it is I had colleagues from other races and colors saying, well, how do we move past this in a way that is meaningful? And so I just wrote some thoughts. But in that, I tell a lot of my personal story and sort of my own sort of sort of things that have gotten me over sort of 
the shade being thrown and the imposter syndromes and a lot of that. So I just put that out there if that's something of interest. Thank you so much for that. Um, we also have a question from Ramey. Hey, Ramey. Nice to meet you. E e meet you. My pleasure as well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the, your location. Yes. Uh, I'm speaking from Nigeria. Yes. Uh, I must confess, uh, such a wonderful presentation and uh, an eye opener. Uh, but uh, I want to ask, what would be your recommendation for young researchers, particularly those in developing countries like ours, Nigeria, to be specific? Because when people talk about racism, racism doesn't just happen uh, in developed countries. Even here in Nigeria, racism happens between uh, the rich and the poor, between those who are better opportune than those who are. So for me, I have experienced a lot of uh, uh, racist statements. Like uh, a professor once told me, can anything good come out of you? You know, and he once told me, we don't accept. Uh, uh, online PhD certificate here. You, so those are challenges, uh, you know, and a lot of times they tend to put young researchers, you know, commonize them and uh, see if their voice cannot be heard. What would be your recommendation for young researchers like my humble self and some other uh, uh, out there uh, to enable them actually explore their profession and do great and mighty things than the archaic uh, uh, professor who believe uh, they are the father of all, probably in your department or in your field of uh, discipline. Thank you, Anova. Yeah, so great, great questions. And yeah, I, I was noticing some of the comments. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, there are all kinds of isms, right? There, even in there, there are there are caste systems or not caste systems. There are power structures and designations very much within the academy. The very notion of assistant associate and full professor is a, as a, a power structure system, right? And so you're going to deal with those. And so because of those, you're going to have people that very much try to flex on you. And when I mean that, I say that I'm using it very colloquially, but are going to try to sort of sort of make sure you know they're the senior person and you're the junior person. And again, part of that will only erode as we change the mindset of the people conveying knowledge or mentoring people or serving as advisors on committees, right? Uh, there's still a lot of gender bias, a lot of other types of bias that I see in the academy. But the good news, uh, Ramey, is that we're now, there are people like me and you having these discussions. So it will take some time to infect the, the uh, you know, to become a, a sort of reverse pandemic in academia, to sort of, to, to get rid of some of this sort of power structure, power dynamics that goes on. It will take a complete change of approach in a lot of different areas. I'll give you an example. One of the things that we stopped, you know, we, we had, we used to, in our department here at Georgia, we'd have this happy hour after the colloquium series when people come in to give colloquium. Now, I don't mind going to happy hour. I don't have a problem with that. But it, it had become such a culturally embedded thing that there were people that felt left out if they had families or that they didn't like going to bars or they didn't drink alcohol. And so it created a sort of a sort of a different sort of sort of groups and silos culturally within the department because of just something that seemed so innocent and simple. So my point in raising that is that when we start to be aware of these types of practices, we, we start to be aware of microaggressions, which I talk about in the book, microaggressions, um, you can start to sort of not accept them anymore, right? I'll give you an example that I've dealt with my entire career. I have been someone who speaks and give talks and someone, a lot of times people come on, I come off stage and people come up to me and say, wow, you, you speak so well. And on, on, on the surface, that sounds like a harmless compliment, except I've, I've talked to many of my white counterparts. They've, they've never been told that, right? I have three degrees and have gone to college. Of course I can get up and give a, deliver a talk. Now you have to understand that for some people, they really do just mean it that way. But I think because of some so cultural marinades and narratives, 
you know, for some people like, wow, there's this black guy up there and he actually sounds like he's talking about this and that. So those, those, it's a microaggression, right? And so you all have experienced them from different perspectives. I see them all of the time um, from gender perspectives or from where you, where you may have grown up. So when we become aware of these, Ramey, uh, when we become, a, and, and, you know, not, and push back, on them will make progress. Now, I, I, don't, I, I will say this. I don't want you to leave this discussion without understanding this as young scholar, scholars. And it's some advice that my mentor, Dr. Warren Washington, passed on to me. Warren Washington, Google him if you don't know who he is. He received the Presidential Medal of Science in 2011, I think. He said, for all the engagement, all the outreach that you're going to be asked to do because you are articulate, because you are uh, perhaps you know unique in this field and so forth, establish your credibility in your field first. And from that, let everything flow. And the point he was making there is that, you know, of course, people are going to ask me to come speak. And of course, whenever there's a new grad student coming into the department, they're going to go, oh, go talk to the black professor. All right. When that's you, know, they could go talk to any of the professors and learn about what's going on in the department. Now, I can give them some perspective, but we carry an extra burden this time at times is communities of color as women and so forth and becoming sort of the sort of I don't want to say but the token person to go talk to about certain things or to go out to speak to this group and in doing all of those things it can become a burden on the things that you need to do early in your career which is publish which is establish your scholarship so I want to make sure you understand that you still have to play the game. You still have to establish your credibility, publish, get the grants, write the papers, the books, if you're in more of a social sciences or a humanities field. But you don't have to play the game in exactly the same way it was played back in 1950. I'll give you another example, because it's important for you all to understand this, how inherently biased the system is. One of the things that when you go to apply for a job as a professor that often were asked, because I write a lot of letters of reference for people, and there are things like these H indices and citation indexes that, out there, that are out there to y'all, make sure you understand them. Go to Google Scholar. You can look up mine or look up someone. There are these different indices, the I-10 indices. But one of the things that you'll learn is a lot of these indices are, you know, they, they, they get a lot of weight in job searches and reviews but they're inherently biased because you're going to have more citations the longer you've been around. And a lot of us are just entering the field or have been historically limited access to the fields and so forth. So we need new types of indices, for example, for impact so that people can evaluate you fairly. All right. So these are just some things that I just want you all to be aware of. And it kind of just was piggybacking off of Ramey's question. I see Umar has a question. He says, I'd like for you to elaborate on, let's say, whenever a person starts talking about climate change, someone would jump right in and start giving arguments that are apparently correct. Or do you mean, but when, when you do an, an, analyze these arguments, you can see that these kind of reasons just some, OK, I think you meant incorrect, maybe. Yeah, motivated reason is certainly there. Uh, motivated pull, which pull the science into kind of obscurity. Uh, we want to, so the challenge could be dealing with the people, even in the intellectuals are not only lame. What could be the pathways to deal with these kinds of situations? So that's a really good question, Umar. In the area of climate change, one of the things that, that, to answer that question, I understand the six Americas. Yale Climate Communication does the Six America study every year, and it identifies the six areas that people fall into. And so what you have to do is you have to understand that there are some people that fall into that category, seven to eight percent of what's called the dismissive category. There are people that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, they're going to anchor in motivated reasoning and biases and ideology. So you can just get into a very circular argument with them. So you don't spend time dealing with them. And so that's what I'm saying. If you understand that you're dealing with someone in that dismissive category, uh, you don't really need to spend much time with that person. Whereas if you're dealing with someone in some of the other categories where they still may have some skepticisms or questions, but you know at least you can have a reasonable conversation, you deal with them in that way. So that's how I tend to deal with uh, people. I, I sort of assess what which of those six Americas they're coming from and then deal with them accordingly. How did you acquire skills to use media as a tool? Did you receive? Yeah, great. This is an amazing question, actually. 
So in college, I actually took a public speaking course, right? Not because I knew I was going to need it somewhere, but I just thought it might be useful because I knew I was going to be a scientist. Uh, when I was at NASA, I took a media training course. And that media training course is something that many, I think many students should be exposed to. We actually try to do a little of it. We, we Instead of just a typical graduate seminar in our department now where we have a scholarly speaker come, we now have instituted some professional development seminars where we do media training or we teach people how to write blogs or social media best practices and so forth. So yes, there is training that you don't get in a typical graduate program often. Uh, and that's what I meant by end-to-end -end scholarship. I firmly believe master's and PhD programs need to be fundamentally turned on their heads and include what we are currently teaching, but also insert these skills to, to make you um, uh, better prepared to be end-to-end -end scholars. Thank yeah, you so thanks. much. That will um, actually be our last question. Yes, yes. Which, which I, I'm, I'm so sorry about because this has been just an absolutely phenomenal conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining us, um, Dr. Shepard. Um, this has been incredibly illuminating, I think, for, for all of us, certainly for me. Um, I'm really quickly going to close us out um, by just um, reminding us that we uh, do meet uh, at the general meeting the third Friday of every month at 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, additionally, though it's not on the slide, our uh, executive meetings are open to everybody. So if you're ever interested in getting more involved in the GSC, um, including suggesting speakers, um, participating in event organization or anything like that, the executive board meets the first Friday of every month also at 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, additionally, we um, have the uh, workshop and mentoring group meeting on Friday the 24th and the DEI workshop with Dr. Uh, Harue Wu on Friday, March 31st. So please join us for those. Please join us for our next general meeting on Friday, April 21st. 